can go from there. Okay. So hi everyone, thanks for being here tonight. My name is Anna Meadows and I'm a volunteer coordinator with the Springfield Community Gardens. We're based in Springfield, Missouri. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're a nonprofit whose vision is a world where everyone has access to healthy local food. And part of the way that we do that is through this workshop series, um, which is a part of a larger workshop series on regenerative agriculture topics and is generously funded in part by the USDA. Um, our speaker tonight is Patrick Byers with um, NU Extension and I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. I have a couple of housekeeping things before we get started, so I'll do those as well right now. Um, there'll be a Q&A session towards the end of this workshop. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. Um, if you click on that, oh, it looks like I have a question already, perfect. Um, you can type in your question there and we will get to them um, during the Q&A session. And how that'll work is I will read the questions to Patrick and Patrick will answer them um, right here. So that's kind of how that works. The, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's also a chat button. If you could use that only for comments throughout the night, that helps me kind of delineate between questions and comments. So that would be helpful if you would do comments only in the chat section. Let's see, anything else? Yes, after this workshop is over, once you leave the workshop, a screen will pop up with a link to a post-workshop survey. Um, the survey is used in SCG's reporting to the USDA and also helps us provide meaningful workshops to, to everyone in the future. Um, it only takes a few minutes, so we would appreciate it if you would take those few minutes to fill that out at the end of this workshop. So I think that's it for me. Patrick, feel free. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you joining me tonight, Anna. And I appreciate everyone who's joining uh, the uh, the workshop. Um, I, I'm assuming since you're here tonight that you share my interest and passion in maple syrup, and that's fabulous. Um, my name is Patrick Byers. I'm a horticulture field specialist with University of Missouri Extension. And I'm based in Webster County, which is one county to the east of Springfield. And I'm very excited to be teaming with Springfield Community Gardens on our workshop series over the next year. Well, tonight the subject matter is, is uh, syrup making. And um, <clears throat> I'm actually gonna turn over much of the program tonight to my friend, Henry Whitener, who is a syrup maker. Uh, I've known Henry for, gosh, going on 30 years now. And he always amazes me with, with the interesting things that he does. But among other things, he is a master syrup maker. And I think you'll enjoy the video that I shot uh, in January. I had a chance to spend a couple of days with Henry and, and we shot a video on all aspects of syrup making. And so we'll be showing the video, it'll be about an hour long. And I think you'll find it a pretty good coverage of the, the subject of making syrup. And then after the uh, end of the video, we'll have a question and answer session that uh, Anna will moderate. And again, uh, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A as we go through the video. Um, I'll mention a couple of things to start off with. Um, Henry's uh, approach to syrup making is very much home syrup making. He's not marketing syrup. He's not um, producing syrup that, that uh, has to meet uh, USD grade, USDA grades or anything like that. He does it purely out of the pleasure and the, the joy of sharing his passion with others. But for those who are interested in, in sort of moving on to the next step, which would be commercial scale syrup making, there are excellent resources available from the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry. And I'll mention a couple of things um, that you'll see in the video that, that uh, would be different, again, if you were uh, making a syrup for a, a commercial market. Uh, first of all, of course, you would be using food grade equipment. Uh, everything that touches the, uh, the uh, syrup would be food grade. Uh, you would be likely producing syrup at a larger scale than, than Henry is, and uh, you would likely be upgrading some of your equipment to take advantage of efficiencies. And you might even be considering a, a, a tube collection system for the sap rather than the bucket system that, that we see in the video. And uh, Henry actually spent a lot of time talking about cleanliness and cleaning up his equipment, but unfortunately that part of the video had to get cut from the standpoint of length. So uh, you know, don't, don't be misled that Henry doesn't keep a clean sugar house or sugar uh, shack, he does indeed. But again, when you move up to commercial scale production, then cleanliness becomes critically important. And again, more information on that is available uh, in the resources from the Center for Agroforestry. And then the final thing I'll mention is our video tonight is focused on maple syrup, but that's not the only type of tree that you can tap. And in fact, there's, a, there's sort of a groundswell of interest in tapping other types of trees to make syrup. And probably uh, uh, 
Uh, American black walnut has been utilized as much as any other species, but there are others that might be considered as well. Uh, soft maples, for example, and, and perhaps even other species. And again, for more information on that, uh, particularly on black walnut syrup production, check out the uh, Center for Agroforestry. Okay, with all of that said, let's go ahead and get started with the video. <clears throat> okay, Anna, can we see the video? Not yet. Is it up now? I think, maybe, I think when you press play, we'll be able to see it. Yep, there it is. Excellent. Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Thank you for joining us for our video, Home Maple Syrup Production. I'm thrilled to be joining Henry Whitener of Trace Creek Farm, Master Home Syrup Maker, for tonight's presentation. We'll first start with some introductory material on maple syrup production. Then we'll visit Henry's Sugar Bush. Then we'll visit Henry's Sugar Shack. Then we'll actually go through the process. We'll start with boiling sap on the first day of our, our time together. Then we'll continue boiling sap on the second day. Then we'll finish the sap, we'll bottle it, and we'll end up enjoying it. So thank you very much for joining us and I hope you enjoy the video. I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. I'm so excited to be here with my friend Henry Whitener and to learn about home maple syrup production. Henry, tell us about why you're interested in maple syrup and how long you've been doing this. Well, I've been doing it for uh, about five years and uh, my interest is uh, likes good Christmas presents. True. And uh, also I give it to friends. Uh, my kids like it, grandkids. It's something that I like to keep going. Uh, and uh, I just kind of like it doing it. And, Gets me out of the house in the wintertime. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, what is the sugar bush? Well, the sugar bush is the collection of trees that the home syrup maker taps. In other words, drills a hole in, places a tap, collects the sap that flows out, and then this sap becomes the raw material that will eventually become syrup. In our video, we'll be focused on sugar maples, but other tree species can be tapped as well. American black walnut, sycamore, uh, soft maples such as silver maples and perhaps other tree species as well. In this portion of the video, we'll be talking about selecting a good tree to tap. We'll be take a look at some different types of taps. We'll actually go through the process of tapping trees using both a hand brace and uh, an electric drill. We'll talk about the best time to tap trees and to collect sap, and then we'll actually collect the sap from Henry's sugar bush. So now we're, we're out in the sugar bush, which is kind of an interesting term, right? <laughs> yes, but, it uh, is. But tell us about your sugar bush, Henry. Well, this is a little bottom down here. There's a little creek on the side of it there, and there's several uh, hard maples in here. So uh, do you tap mainly hard maples? Yes, that's all I tap. Uh, I've got some soft maple that I could, but uh, the soft maple will have a lower sugar content than the hard maple will, and uh, it takes less boiling down. So how do, you, how do you tell a hard maple during the winter? <laughs> That's a good question, Pat. Generally by the bark, and I don't know, uh, there's, I'm sure if you had a forester down here, he could explain it a lot well, better than what I can. Well, you, you, I mean, I'm sure you're out here during the growing season, you pretty much know which of these trees are, are gonna be hard maples for tapping. And do yep. they have to be a certain size before you tap? Well, <clears throat> they always claim, uh, if I can get it right, 12 to 10 inches, one tap. Mm -hmm. 12 to 16 inches or 18 inches, two taps. Anything over 20 inches, three taps. Okay. okay. I mean, that's kind of rule of thumb. I only tap one tap per tree. I've got enough to take care of with buckets I've got. Uh, so I don't overdo it. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna tap them real hard. Uh, one thing I will point out on tapping, uh, I don't know if I can find the old tap, They'll generally grow over pretty good, but when you tap next year, the rule of thumb is over six, up six, or down six. That way you don't tap 
the same height all the way around, otherwise you'll girt the tree or you can girt the tree. So I would say at least go four inches over, either go up, you know, like next year, put a tap here, and then maybe the next year, you know, go down here and put a tap or put a tap here and then next year go there. So if, if you do a good job with your tapping, you're not going to hurt the tree. No, uh -uh, right? no, you shouldn't hurt the tree. But it is important not to put them in the same line <coughs> around the tree. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, that's from what I've read, and it makes sense. I mean, you know, if you just tap around, you'll, if you just keep tap, 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 you would eventually probably kill a tree. Uh, the tree to tap. Uh, <clears throat> what I've been told, uh, this right here, I kind of call this my mother tree down here in this uh, patch of woods down here or the maples. Uh, basically, you want a tree that is a shade tree. You want a lot of branches on the top. Uh, you want a lot of buds up there because the more buds you have on a tree, the more sap is required. Uh, basically, the buds tell the roots, I need something to eat so I can... Uh, make leaves or whatever and uh so basically you want a nice tree a nice branch out then will generally run better than just a straight tree what i call a log tree uh where you have a nice straight stem a little top uh so this one right here has been a real good tree for me it generally runs really good well, Henry, the purpose of the tap, of course, is to, to help collect the sap as it comes out of the tree from the hole that you bored into it. And we've got several different kinds of taps here. I think these are pretty cool. So if you don't mind, talk us through the different types of taps. All right. Well, <clears throat> from what I've heard, <clears throat> this is an elderberry deal. Uh, <clears throat> most of them, they're solid, but they've got a little puffy. So you clean them out, you drill a hole, you put it in there, put a nail a bucket, or put a nail in the tree, hang a bucket bucket on the nail. So that might have it. been the way that our, our ancestors <clears throat> probably tapped so. trees, yeah. I'd say that was, didn't have money. Then they came out <clears throat> with these right here. This one right here, a neighbor of mine had it, and it's probably over 100 years old. Those are, those are pretty cool. So this would be pushed into the tree, yeah. and you'd hook your bucket on this hook here, and then the sap yeah. would, would drip down into the bucket. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's been rusted, and, and I, I cleaned them up, and so I just put them in my house. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so made out of cast iron. That's probably what they would have used a hundred years ago, or even yeah, Well, yeah, uh, it ain't no telling how long it was. That's pretty cool. <coughs> and then these three here. Our newer ones, these are the ones that I've bought. Uh, this is plastic, these two here are metal, and uh, they basically work the same way. Uh, this right here's got, uh, this right here you hang a bucket on, this right here's got a little hook you hang the bucket on, and it drips in there. Uh, one thing you wanna do, which I like my buckets better, <clears throat> whenever you do that, you need to have a roof over it, keep the rain or whatever uh, junk out of, the, out of your sap as much as possible. So is there a standard size hole that you drill in the tree to accommodate these taps? Five sixteenths. Is that the same for all of these taps? Uh, this one right here, Maybe probably a little, older one, yeah. little deal. And then these right here, you just look for a five sixteenths or whatever size. Stem, <laughs> a stem little bit, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the newer taps, I think five sixteenths is what you use taps. And uh, when we tap them in there, uh, you drive them in. You don't drive them in hard. You just kind of tap them in. And, and I suspect our ancestors probably used a hand brace and bit to drill it. But, yes. Uh, what, what do you use? Uh, I, I, I do a little cheating. I use a cordless drill. Okay, very good. <laughs> let's, let's see what tapping is like on a tree now. All right. Let's go tap. Well, Henry, I'm, I'm out here with you in the sugar bush. I've got my brace and bit. We've found a tree suitable for tapping, but how do you pick out the best spot to put the tap? Well, it depends on if you're using buckets, you want to make sure it's high enough that your bucket's not on the ground. The way I do it, I have them fairly low and I keep my buckets down. One thing 
<clears throat> you want to kind of watch for, they always say, and it makes sense, look at your roots. You got this root coming up through here. You're going to have more sap flow through here than you will probably here. Uh, that's the way I understand it. Uh, but you also got to remember, once you get one tap in, this tree has not been tapped, so we can tap it anywhere we want to. So we're going to, we're going to use that one there. We're going to come up here probably about right here, Pat. All right, so this is the spot right here. That's it, right there. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and again, use the brace and bit, but how deep do I need to go into the tree? Well, <clears throat> some, of the, some of the taps, not very deep. I like to go an inch and a half. Inch and a half. And so that's it's about this far here, right? Yes. On the thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were looking at right here, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get this hole tapped. Also, Pat, <clears throat> when you're drilling, drill at an angle up. You don't want to drill down because you want the sap to flow out of your tap into your bucket. All right, so I'm drilling a little bit at an angle uh, above yep. the horizontal. Right, yeah. All right, I think I'm getting into where it needs to go, Henry. I think so too. And it looks like we've got a little sap trying to run out of that. Yeah, there's, there's definitely some moisture here. Yeah. in the uh, in the uh, sawdust we brought out of the hole. Yeah, you might run back in there and uh, just kind of clean the hole out a little bit because uh, a lot of your taps got a fairly small hole. When I tap, I really like for them to be running good and they'll kind of self-clean self out. And that one's, that one's doing pretty doggone that's, that's good. That's pretty wet, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So You can see we've got sap coming out of the uh, hole that we just drilled. Okay, we've got the, the uh, tree tapped, we've got the hole drilled, and we've got some sap coming out. What's the next step? Well, pick out the tap you're going to do, use or whatever, and you stick it in there. Should have a hammer, but a rock works just as good and you just kind of easy into it. And as you tap, it makes a little bit of a noise. And then once you kind of get it in there, because you want to seal around that <clears throat> where that doesn't leak out there. And uh, that should do it. Well, we've drilled the tree and put the tap in and we've got sap flowing. So, Henry, we've got to catch that sap. We've got to catch it some way. This right here is one way. It's, uh, I think, a fairly cheap. It's got a bag on it. It's got a hole in here. And uh, basically, you just put it up there, put it over there, hang it on there, and you let it flow. And then you come what, back tomorrow. What, what's the capacity of that bag? That I really couldn't tell you, Patty. It's probably a gallon, gallon and a half, probably. Okay. Something like that. So that, that's one way. Another way would be to use use uh, a bucket. Mm -hmm. That is. You can actually hang a bucket on some taps that the bucket has a cover over it, or you can put a bucket on the ground and run a hose from the tap into the bucket. That's right. This tree here is a little on the small side, but it'll work. It's about 10 inches, so we're going to got a root coming up here. Got kind of a small place there where it's kind of level, and we're going to do it a little faster than what Pat did. Well, that one right there ain't running like the other one did. What we're going to do, we're going to do a cheap bucket type deal here. You can save your five gallon milk jugs and you can put them in there, put your tap in there, and then we're going to take our hammer and we're going to do it like that. Then we're going to take our milk jug. 
This ain't gonna work too good. Man. There we go. It's gonna work. And we're gonna put our milk jug on there. And there we go. A cheap bucket. <laughs> Well, we've successfully tapped a tree. We put out some buckets and a jug. And uh, how often do you have to check these buckets and jugs when the sap is flowing? Well, when the sap is flowing, I'll, I generally check every day. Uh, so every you can tour. get you can get quite a bit of, of sap in one day from a tree. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, you can. So, so what are the weather conditions that really favor sap flow? <clears throat> the way I understand it is, you want temperature that is above freezing in the daytime, preferably sunshine. Uh, and then at night you want it to be below freezing because they claim the way I understand it, sap does flow both ways. Mm -hmm. It'll go up in the daytime. When it gets uh, cold, it'll flow back down. So we catch it going both ways. And uh, in, in your sugar bush, uh, when do you typically start tapping <clears throat> trees and collecting sap and how long does it last? Well, this year I started tapping probably earlier than I should have. Uh, but we had some good days. I thought the sap would run good, and and they did. A couple of days, it ran good. Uh, generally, February, uh, generally last of January, sometime in February. Uh, you know, I said it before, and you know it. Missouri, you never know about right. Missouri weather. Uh, so you could start collecting as early as? This year, I started tapping right after Christmas. And then as late as? Uh, March. I have tapped in March. Uh, they claim... Your first sap is your clearer sap, uh, grade A syrup as they call it. Your March or your end of the season is your darker sap. So it's uh, less grade, doesn't uh, demand as much on the, uh, price wise on the market. So uh, generally just try to catch a week or two and uh, uh, hopefully you have good weather. Very what good. you can do too also I've heard and I've tried it this year <clears throat> is uh, if, uh, if a tree doesn't run, it quits running, uh, if you go back in and redrill it, you can kind of open it back up and it'll run a little better. So redrill the same hole. Right, right. The same tank. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just because, you know, basically we're putting wound on the tree and uh, the tree's going to start healing probably as soon as we get through drilling and uh, it will heal up. And uh, some of the holes you can go back... <clears throat> uh, some of them you can find fairly easy. Some of them you can't hardly even tell from year to year. They will heal over. So, uh. <clears throat> all right, now we've got our taps all in. Hopefully the had good weather for the sap to run and we'll find out how things have gone. And generally, come up here, keep, keep a rock on the bucket, keep it from blowing off. Basically, pull that down, pick it over. Put it in another bucket, put it back, put the lid on, put that on, make sure we didn't do nothing with our tap up there, didn't lose it, and then All we'll right. start well, working I, our way out. I can go to... ahead and tackle these over here. Yep. That will be the last one there, Pat. I've got the others. The sugar shack is where the magic happens, where sap becomes syrup. Now, the sugar shack can be elaborate or it can be very basic. We'll spend a little time in Henry's Sugar Shack, taking a look at his equipment and also the furnace that he has developed, which provides the heat that boils the sap that becomes the syrup. 
Okay, this is Sugar Shack, what I have. I built a shed. Uh, I've always wanted to make syrup, and uh, I wasn't going to do it outside. So I did build a little shed here. Uh, inside is my furnace. I've got my pans on there. I've got my pan that I cook down with. On the back side, <clears throat> you'll be able to see uh, a little later probably what I call a warming pan. And to me, that's very important when you're cooking is to have some place where you can preheat your sap before you put it into your pan to cook down. On each side there, I've got firewood. I stack it inside to kind of keep it dry. Over here, there's another stack of firewood that I've got. Uh, what I do, I use slabs. It's not ideal, but it does work. And uh, I'm going to burn them anyway or get rid of them. So this is a good place to get rid of them. So we'll go inside. This is the inside of the sugar shack. This is my main pan that I use that I cook down. Uh, back here is a, another pan. It's what I call a warmer pan. And uh, I'll fill this up and then I'll fill that up. And then as this cooks down, I'll put that sap into here and then I'll fill it back up to keep the sap, get it a little warmer so it uh, doesn't kill my boil in my pan. Over there, I've got what I call my finish pan. <clears throat> uh, I don't make enough syrup that I can finish it in this pan. Uh, this pan, uh, six gallons is as low as I can take it. So once it gets down to that, I'll put it in that and then I'll cook it on down pretty well to syrup. Over here, as I collect the sap, <clears throat> I've got these totes over here. Uh, this is where I store my sap. Uh, and then uh, with Missouri, the way Missouri is, you have a nice day, it turns off cold or else it gets nice and it stays nice for a long time. You do have to worry about your sap spoiling. It will spoil if the temperature gets up there and it stays up there for a while. Uh, one thing that I've done uh, is I'll take these bottles and I'll freeze them. And if I think it's going to get too warm, I'll just toss them in there for ice. And that seems to work out pretty good for me. Uh, and so uh, this is no little handy deal that I like, I really like. Uh, I can do that later, but I maneuver my sap around with it, take it from one part to the other. Uh, this is my furnace. Basically, I had the furnace made. I know a guy, he's a millwright, and he's retired, and we talked about syrup. And uh, this is was a 55, or not a 55, but a 300-gallon gas tank. And uh, when I bought my pan, I took the tank up there to him, he cut the top off where my pan sat right on top. He flipped the back side over for my chimney stack and uh, made me a door. The door's not quite like I'd like to have it. It's a little heavy, a little awkward. But uh, anyway, it works out real good. Uh, I like it. It works for me. And uh, I guess that's all that really matters. The process of making maple syrup is pretty straightforward. We start with sap. Sap is dilute. It has a sugar content of perhaps three degrees bricks. Through the process of boiling, we draw off the moisture. And when the process is finished, we have maple syrup, which has a degrees bricks of somewhere between 67 and 70. So a lot of concentration takes place during the boiling process. In this part of the video, we'll take a look at the first day of boiling sap. We'll take a look at filling the pans. We'll talk about using a refractometer, which is an instrument that measures the sugar content of the sap and eventually the syrup. We'll talk generally about making syrup. We'll see the process of skimming to help start cleaning up the syrup. And then we'll talk about adding additional sap to continue the boiling process. This we're going to put water in the pans. And uh, it's really nice to have somebody here with me. Uh, to put that in there, lift these totes up and put them in there. If I don't have anybody with me, generally I'll put them in there with a five gallon bucket at a time. So anyway, this is one of the totes and we'll just dump it in there. 
And this pan right here will generally hold right at 50 gallons of, of sap. And uh, that's a little over a gallon of syrup, or should be. And then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, put this bucket here in my warmer. It holds about five gallons. And then I'll be done with that. And then I'll get another bucket out of here to make that a little lighter. And then I'll have my helper here. Uh, we'll take this. And I don't recommend doing this once you have a fire going because if you put it on here and that's hot with this plastic, you're liable to burn your uh, my storage tank here or my tote here. So anyway, we've got water in our pans. That is one thing you want to make sure when you're cooking syrup, which you probably already know, uh, never have a dry pan over a fire. You'll run your pan pretty quick. So always keep water in there or sap in there or something in there to uh, keep from running your pan. So anyway, this pan right here, I bought it at a farm auction. I was lucky enough, uh, got it fairly cheap. Uh, that's probably a pretty expensive pan. That's, uh, uh, I can't think of the metal of it now, now. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, stainless steel. Uh, they recommend stainless steel. It cleans up easier. Uh, my finished pan over there, it's metal, uh, which you have to worry about once you get done, about rusting, and uh, when your uh, other pans won't rust out. So anyway, that's it. Now we're going to light a fire, and we'll be ready to start balling. Okay, you'll get debris in here, uh, especially in the woods when you're gathering sap. Uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but right here, that's some cedar twigs. Uh, one thing you want to try to keep your buckets covered once we get down there when we collect some sap. Uh, I always keep my buckets covered. Uh, one thing you can do, you can do it now. Take a little strainer. You can go through and pick the bigger stuff up if you want to. Or you can wait. And once it starts boiling, it'll have a foam on it. And... Uh, Hopefully we can get a good picture of that. that don't have too much steam coming off. And I just have this little deal right here. And I just go through and pick the foam up and uh, take it outside and beat it against the side of the shack there and it comes off and then just keep cooking. And then I generally strain it a couple of times. We'll go into that a little later on the straining process. Get a fire going here. I've I would love if you could get a hold of it. All I care about is a spoonful, not even a spoonful. But walnut syrup. All right, we've got a little bit of a ball going here. We'll put some more wood in here in a second. Uh, two things that uh, need to do or I do is, is one, you can stir it. I got a little paddle here I made out of sassafras and uh, kind of move the, the sap around, get hot spots, cold spots, uh, and kind of keep it off the bottom. Uh, I like to think that if it sets on the bottom, it could scorch. Some people will argue that with me, so uh, whatever. But anyway, I'll start it a little bit. Another thing I think is pretty important is skimming. Just get a little sieve or something, and the foam that's on there, you can go through and uh, 
pick it up, and uh, that's what it will look like. You'll catch a lot of dirt, uh, a lot of stuff, leaves or twigs or bugs or whatever that is in there, sometimes even ants. You may see ants in the buckets when we go down and gather them because they like the sweet stuff. And uh, basically, and then pound it on the side over there and just kind of cleans the syrup up a little bit. We don't have as much uh, garbage in there whenever you uh, filter it. And since we've kind of halfway not really lost our boil, but anyway, we'll put some wood in the furnace. Uh, it took me about one time with my regular leather gloves until I got my welding gloves out. Because <laughs> these do get pretty hot. Anyway, uh, and then go to my wood pile and just whatever's there. Just start chunking a bunch of wood in. Some people really like a hot fire. Uh, I guess I'm a little scared of fire. I just like to keep my ball going. If I can keep my ball going, then I'm happy. Uh, and lots of times you'll have a good ball, you'll put in fresh wood, especially if it's a little wet or a little green, you'll lose a ball till the fire catches back up. Put my door back on and then let it sit for a while. This little instrument right here is a refractometer. It measures the sugar content of any liquid that you want to do. So what we're going to do, we're going to take some sap that we've collected and I'm going to test it and see how much sugar is in it. Just take a little bit, put it right on the end of it there. Close the lid down, put it up to the sun, look through there and where the blue and the white come together, we're just a little bit over 3% sugar. So that's what we're starting out with <clears throat> when we put it on the pan. Uh, I will use this fairly often through the process because what we're doing <clears throat> is we're putting it on here and we're boiling the water off, leaving the sugar in there. And for maple syrup, to be maple syrup, it has to be 67% and not over 70% sugar. Uh, it's just a guide that they have, which anything is graded. Uh, if you get over 70% sugar in your syrup, it will start to crystallize in the bottom of your, of your uh, jars or whatever you're canning it in. And uh, I have done that before. I think I, one time I got up to 72 and after about four months in the jar, you see little crystals starting in the bottom of it. And that was kind of neat because basically it's candy. And someday when I get brave enough, I'm going to try to make candy out of this. But I'm not brave enough just yet to do that. So anyway, uh, that's something, a nice little tool to have. Uh, you don't need it. There's other ways of uh, doing it. Well, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along the process. Uh, of making it and once we get down a little bit farther. One thing I will say right now though, you can dip some out in what they call the apron effect. If you look at that, how it just runs off, I mean it just kind of runs off. Once it gets down to sugar, it will call what they call an apron effect. It will come down, it really won't come to a, a, a drip it'll kind of come off and apron down. And that's kind of how the old timers used to do it. Uh, that's how they could tell that it was syrup is when the apron effect. The warmer pan I so told you earlier, uh, which it's steaming, there's a little steam coming off of it. So I mean, you're evaporating that, but it's not boiling and probably won't boil. So anyway, this pan's getting a little on the low side. So I'll take my little scoop and then I'll just uh, dip it from there into here and hopefully I don't kill my boil 
in that too much. But I think it makes sense that if I can put sap in there that's 100 degrees over sap that's about 40 or 50 degrees, it uh, keeps your boil going. And then I'll dip into there. And then whenever I get this pan down fairly low, about one more scoop here. And uh, then I'll take my five gallon bucket and dip over in here where I have got more sap. And I'll fill my warmer pan back up. I'll put just a dab bit more in there. And then, now it's a waiting game. <laughs> okay, right now I had enough, probably 40 gallons, 45 gallons maybe, of sap that I had up here when we started. Uh, we will run our buckets uh, again this evening. Hopefully we had a good run last night, yesterday and tonight, last night and tonight. Uh, that will probably be about a gallon. Uh, they claim... 35 to 50 gallons of sap makes a gallon of syrup. So, uh, and I think that, to me, from what I've figured out, making it about 45 gallons of sap makes a gallon of syrup. And uh, that all depends upon your sugar content of, of the sap. Uh, there is different maple trees. We'll talk about that a little later when we get down. We'll tap a tree or two. Uh, you got what's called soft maples. I think there's three or four soft maples and you got your sugar maple. Your soft maple will be a lot less sugar content. Uh, it will generally run about one to two percent sugar where this right here is running over three percent sugar. So it takes less boiling with the hard maple over the soft maple. And uh, one of the things <clears throat> I read in a book one time, they always said that the soft maple was a poor man's sugar or maple syrup. The hard maple was a rich man's because when they came over here, your hard maple logs were worth more than your soft maple logs. So the poor guy sold his hardwood or maple, hard maple, and your rich guy sold soft maple and kept the hardwood for syrup. So I don't know if there's any truth to that or not, but it makes sense. <laughs> Lots of times when you have your bowl going with the way the fire is, this down here is pretty warm, pretty little warmer right here in the middle. And it's starting to boil a little bit down there. But lots of times you can take and just kind of stir it around, get your hot sap where the cold is and the cold where the hot is, and to kind of keep it uh, more boiling. Because <clears throat> the way I understand it, the more surface area you have, the quicker you'll boil down. Uh, you know, some people use a turkey fryer to boil it down, but you only got like a 12 inch circle and you'll spend two days boiling this down. And a tank of propane, where this right here, you can boil it down a lot quicker, the more surface area you have. And then what I'm going to do, just grins, we've got a bowl going there. And now it's gone. <laughs> and it's kind of neat. You can tell kind of when it starts to boil. If you listen to it, you know, it had that little simmer and then it'll start back up and get boiling again. The second day of boiling the sap is a day of excitement. 
the original dilute sap has become increasingly concentrated and we're approaching syrup. We'll watch the pan boil, we'll continue to take measurements with the refractometer, and we'll continue to monitor the progress. We have to keep a close eye on activities at this point. It could be very easy for the sap to rise up and boil out of the pan or for the pan to boil dry. So we'll definitely be keeping a close eye as the sap becomes syrup. Here we are. The next morning we boiled yesterday. Uh, we probably boiled till we started about one, two o'clock, I think, yesterday. Got a good boil going. We boiled till dark, and then we kind of let the fire die down, just let it set overnight. Uh, and so here we are the next morning, finishing it off. We started out probably, I figure, 35 to 40 gallons. Right now, we're probably down to about 15 uh, gallons, maybe a little less than that. Uh, and uh, we're about done with this pan because I always kind of check it, the low or the high part of the pan, which we got a, probably a half inch to eat yet, so we'll keep boiling in this. And uh, once our boil gets going, uh, we'll get that down fairly quick. Uh, we'll check the sugar content of it and uh, with our little handy tool there and get a little bit on my finger put it in there and uh, check it and we're right at 10% sugar we started out at 3.5% sugar so now we're down to 10 point or 10% sugar so we still got a uh, good 50 55 percent to get it down to or boil down to where we have about 65-70% sugar to make maple syrup. Uh, and so it's just kind of a waiting game. This point in the whole process, uh, I like to be up here pretty well all the time because it gets kind of critical. You don't want a dry pan. Uh, we'll take it off. We'll filter it. We'll go through that once we do take it off, how I filter my sap. So it's just kind of a waiting game and uh, get a good boil going, which you can see the steam here coming off. Uh, good old water leaving and the sugar staying behind. Well, we're hanging out here at the sugar shack and we're about halfway through the boil and you got to keep a close eye on the, the uh, uh, sap at this point. But I can't think of a better place to be than on a cold day than in a, a warm sugar shack. And uh, Henry's going to make me some maple tea. All right. Basically, we just reach in there, get a little sap. If I can see your cup there, from pour it in there. There you go. And of course, the sweeter you want your tea, the uh, the longer you wait into the boil. <laughs> that is correct. So we'll pour a couple more cups here. All right, well, I can't wait to try this. That's right. Cheers. Cheers, Pat. To maple syrup. Well, after a couple of cups of maple tea, it's 
Time for us to get back to work, Henry. That's What's right. Next? That's right. We got to finish this off here today. So, anyway, the filtering system, the way there's several ways of doing it. We're going to kind of go through three that I've tried and I'll t kind of tell about what I like about each one and what I don't like about. This right here, this is just a piece of cheesecloth folded about four times. If you don't mind, Pat, hand me some clothespins. And uh, what, what I do is uh, so that this don't fall down in there. Uh, we'll put those pins around it. Always kind of surprised me. You think, well, you got your buckets. Uh, you know, you got them covered. Don't really think there'd be much dirt or debris in there, but uh, this may make a liar out of me. But generally, uh, there's quite a bit of debris that you want out of there, so you have a nice, clean maple syrup when you uh, when you can it. So I think that right there will probably be enough, Pat. Okay. So basically, if a guy was on a bigger scale, you'd have a spigot in here in the pan. You just put that right underneath there and turn the spigot on. Uh, I don't, so I dip. And uh, basically just... It's kind of a slow process, I guess, but anyway. Uh, you... Do what you're comfortable with or do with what you got. And so, you can already see color in that. Yeah, yeah. If you kind of look just right, it's got a nice color to it. It'll probably get a little darker as it gets down. Uh, we did test it. Uh, and we're down to, what was it, 13%? It's about 13%. So we still got a ways to go. But uh, I found as you get the sugar content gets higher, uh, it does boil down a little quicker. Or it seems like it goes quicker. So there you can see a little. You can see, yeah, some of the, some of the uh, <coughs> debris that you're filtering yeah, out. Yeah, mm-hmm. We probably should have maybe folded that again. We're not getting as much as what I thought we'd get, but anyway. Uh, so you, you have this whole operation set up so that most of the, what you do, you can do with one person. Well, that's kind of, it's kind of nice because uh, most time when I'm doing this, uh, I invite friends over. Uh, it's kind of a fun day. Get to catch up on things. Uh, talking about what we used to do, how we used to be able to do it all, and what we can do now in our later years. Yeah. But, uh, and I think the guys, when they come over, they know when they come over and sit with me all day and help me out, uh, their pay is a little bit of maple syrup. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've about got done with my big pan. Uh, so I'm dipping it out and filtering it. And uh, there's debris. You can see some of the debris that's in there. Some of the debris that we're catching here, some of this debris I won't get out, it'll just stay in this pan. But, uh, and then we're putting it into our other, what I call my finish pan, which we've got it on the fire. Uh, we already, this is a turkey fryer. We filled it up one time. It's in the finishing pan. And then we're gonna, when we get everything dipped out of here, then we'll pour the rest of it in there. And then we'll get down to the nitty gritty of it and make them getting the syrup made. That right there is about it. So we're done with my big pan for right now. And uh, everything will be 
cooked off on what I call my finish pan. Now we've dipped everything out of the big pan into here. Uh, we started out probably with close to 40 gallons of sap. My big pan, probably six gallons is what we figured out that when we dipped out of there, put into my finish pan. So there's six gallons in here. Um, and we should come up with uh, hopefully a, a good gallon, maybe a gallon and a half of uh, maple syrup. So now it's just kind of a waiting game. We'll get this boiling. Uh, it's getting ready to boil now. I can hear it. Uh, it's kind of neat whenever you are boiling. Or before it starts to boil, it'll, you can hear it. And uh, we'll point out, hopefully you remember the bubbles that we talked about. The bubbles will start showing up in here. Hopefully we can get a video or a picture of the bubbles as it gets more to maple syrup. So... Anyway, it's just kind of another waiting game. Drink our tea, enjoy ourselves, enjoy the company that's up here with me. And, uh, okay, we talked earlier about the apron effect, and uh, we showed you a little bit of when you get some on there, when it drips off, it's still dripping. Uh, if a guy could have them all together, uh, it's dripping a little slower, kind of a more of a deal. And once we get to syrup, once we get down a lot farther, they call it the apron effect. It'll kind of roll off of there rather than just run down kind of, but there's just kind of a stream there. And uh, we'll take some more videos of that later on when we get closer to sap. Uh, right now we're still at probably a little below 20. Uh, so. Uh, but that tells you your sugar content is getting thicker and uh, that's just one way of telling that you are getting closer without the fancy instruments. Okay, now we're down in our finished pan. We're getting down uh, fairly low. That kind of gives me an indication of how much we got in there. We still got a little bit. Uh, so this is kind of to me is a critical point of stern. We talked about the apron effect. When you look at it, if you kind of, it's not just running, running, it's kind of wanting to drip a little bit. Uh, so that is the apron effect. So we're getting pretty doggone close to syrup. Uh, we're gonna see just how close we are with syrup. We take our little instrument here, put a little dab on there. Put that over, and we check it, and we're about uh, 39. So we still got a little ways to go uh, before we have syrup to get up to our 67. So, uh, like I said, this right here, this always kind of scares me. When we get to here, I probably should have a little hotter fire in there, but I'm, I guess I'm just too scared. I'm too close to lose it now, and I don't want to scorch it or boil it over or anything. So anyway, that's kind of where we're at on this, and uh, we'll check it a little later here, let it boil down a little more. We do have good steam coming off, pretty good steam, so uh, we'll check it here in a little bit later. Well, Henry, things are happening. We're approaching the end of the boil. 
That's right. Uh, things are going. This is kind of a critical time. Uh, you need to watch it real close. If uh, you can look at it, we talked about the bubbles before. The bubbles in here right now are real small. Uh, you got a little foam on there. They kind of got little circles and you got the little bitty bubbles inside there. So we're getting real close, if not maple syrup. Uh, like I said before, on the apron effect, when you look at it, it uh, it's not running off like it did before. It's kind of dripping off. So that tells me the old timers would probably take it off right now and bottle it. And I would say we're, if we're not there, we're real close. And then uh, another way, uh, right now you gotta really watch that it uh, doesn't get real hot. Uh, I always kind of like to let my fire die down a little bit. Just kind of keep it barely boiling because uh, even though when you look at that, you've only got that much sap in there and basically that's a gallon, gallon and a half, hopefully a gallon and a half. And we started out with about 60 gallons or 70 gallons to start with. So all this work down to this right here, a little bitty batch. <laughs> uh, so if it does boil over, and I've had it done it one time, it will actually raise up and boil over with just that much sap in there. So we're going to get a little, a little tester here and uh, put a little bit of syrup on there. And uh, while you're getting some of the pretty little bubbles, uh, I'll see what we got here. So we're right at 65. So 67 to 70 is maple syrup. Uh, we'll probably leave it on there another five, 10 minutes maybe. And uh, take it off. Check that and see what you got on there, Pat. All right, That's let me take about a look. About 67 or 66, 67, I think. So we may go ahead and take it off and we'll strain it again. I see 66, but, Henry. 66? Okay, so we're right there at it. Uh, I'm going to show a couple ways, another way of straining it uh, with a piece of felt that I've bought strictly for maple syrup. And then once we do that, I'll demonstrate kind of how we, how I prefer to do the settling of it is basically, we'll put it in a turkey fryer, let it set overnight. The settlings will go to the bottom, I'll pour off the top, and then I'll get that up to 180, 200 degrees, and then we'll can it. And then that gives me nice, clear syrup. Uh, so anyway, we're going to take it off now. I think it's time to take it off. And uh, Pat, get your gloves on. All uh, right, I'm ready. <clears throat> lots of times I've got these old welding gloves here because my little leather gloves, sometimes if you handle this very much, it will bleed through there and I'm not going to let go of it even if I burn my hands. <laughs> not at this point, right? Not at this point, because that's uh, the way it is. This is another way of filtering. You've got a, uh, a bag here that's felt, and uh, you got a little liner that fits inside of it. So we'll put that liner down there. Pat, if you want to grab a clothespin or whatever, and uh, kind of put a couple clothespins around the edge of it to keep this from falling down in there. Uh, and underneath this all, I've got a, a turkey fryer, uh, a container for a turkey fryer. And uh, basically we do the dipping again. How well you can see that, but to me that's got a nice color to it, and licking the old wood spoon there, Pat, <laughs> tastes pretty good, didn't it? Yep. <laughs> so. You 
probably can't see in the turkey fryer down there. But uh, to me, that's got a real pretty color to it. Uh, kind of makes everything worthwhile. Uh, like I said, we started out with about 60, 70 gallons from the tree. And uh, hopefully we have a gallon and a half. I think that's probably going to be about it. There's still quite a bit of sap in there, but it's still dripping, so uh, we just kind of let it drip there. And, and uh, you can skip this step right here if you're making and you don't have the filters. You can do it with cheesecloth again. I've done that several times with cheesecloth. But to me, I almost like just take it out of my finish pan, put it in my turkey fryer, just let it settle, uh, generally like overnight or whenever, and then I pour from the top over and uh, leave the settlement in the bottom down there. And it makes a nicer in a jar. Uh, I won't throw away what is in the bottom of that. I'll use that myself. But uh, when I give it away for presents, I like it to... Uh, be a little clearer than what I have made. So, anyway, that's, uh, we've got syrup, Pat. We've got syrup, Henry. This is that, great. Yep. Well, we finished the boil. We finished the syrup. We now have between one to two gallons of maple syrup. But we're not quite finished with the process. There's always some dissolved solids in maple syrup. If you allow the syrup to cool, these solids will settle out, and then you can draw off the clear syrup, which will be a higher quality product. The next step is to reheat the syrup and bottle it. And when we're finished bottling, we now have a shelf stable container of maple syrup. What's the final step? Well, to eat it, of course. And uh, we'll join Henry as we uh, enjoy maple syrup on breakfast pancakes. Okay, now we have got maple syrup. Uh, like I said before, we started out with about 60 gallons of sap, and we're down, we're gonna find out how much syrup we have. But anyway, we got it to syrup out there, and then uh, brought it in, and then my wife here, 45 years, uh, she is going to dip it out of that and put it in jars, and I'll put the lids on it. Linda? It's all yours. <laughs> okay. I'm Linda. They brought this in to me. They had it boiling, had it up to 219 degrees. We've let it cool off to about 180. If it's too hot, it will break the jars. So right now we're ready to put it in jars. I'm going to dip it out of here. We have this thermometer right here with a probe is how we're, we're gauging the temperature. I'm going to take that out. I'm going to dip it out of here and put it into something I can pour with because it's kind of messy, kind of sticky. I'm going to put it in the jars, which are new. If they weren't new, I'd have them washed and sterilized. I'm mm -hmm. going to pour it in. I'm going to leave about a half inch of head space. We always run our finger around the edge, make sure there's nothing on there that will interfere with the seal. He's got lids. The flats have been boiled, so they're good and hot. He's going to put a flat on. He's going to screw it down, not terribly tight, and put it over to the side. On a towel. On a towel, yes. <laughs> so it's kind of tag teaming right now. After we get all of these jars filled, I'll lay a towel over the top of them so they don't cool off too fast. Cool off nice and slow, and it will, that will help, help them seal. The air inside contracts and pulls the lid down and seals them. And it's kind of fun, about two hours later, when they're cooled enough to start sealing, you'll hear pop, pop, pop. And that's the jars sealing themselves. Oh, 
I'm just doing some of each. We give a lot of these away as gifts, and so I guess you can judge your friendship by if you get a pint or a half pint. I don't know. And then later after they're sealed, Henry will take a marker and mark the year and the batch on the lid so we can tell when it was cooked. This batch will be 21 for the year yeah. and three, three, three 21. for the batch. This is the third batch that we've done this year. There we go. I want to get every last drop, of course. That's right. And then if you have some pancakes or an old biscuit, you can swab the inside of that out. That's right. <laughs> really get every last drop. That's right. And of course it doesn't work out just perfectly with your jars. You're forced to eat whatever is left. Ooh. If Pat's lucky. Oh, you're going to come out right? No, Pat? no. We've got enough for a pancake or two. Now you can fill them up a little more, can't you? No, I don't want to fill them too full. That <laughs> mess up the seal. There's a little. That'll be good. Okay. All right. That's how we do it. Okay. So, 12 hours of cooking and 12 hours. Yeah, 12 hours. So, time we started the ball. We've got very pretty syrup. It is pretty syrup. Yep. So. All right. Well, when you're up making the syrup, this is what it's all about. A good woman makes you pancakes for breakfast. Good old maple syrup. And uh, we pour it over there. Have a good hearty breakfast. Good old maple syrup on pancakes. Mighty fine. <laughs> thank you for joining us for our video on home maple syrup production. I'd like to thank Henry Whitener of Trace Creek Farm for leading us through this adventure in making maple syrup. For more information on maple syrup production, visit the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry. The website is here on the screen. And on behalf of University of Missouri Extension, I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist. Thank you again for joining us. Okay. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that video as much as I enjoyed making it with Henry. Uh, really, uh, Henry gave a very nice discussion of, of all aspects of uh, uh, making syrup. And at this point, uh, we've, we've certainly got time for questions. And uh, uh, Anna, do you want to go ahead and start with the questions that are in the Q&A? Yeah, we can do that. Um, first question is from Megan. She asks, she says she's interested in what other trees are good for sugaring locally. Webster County, we have several types of oak, walnut, pignut hickory, pawpaw, and some others we haven't identified yet. Well, I think that the, probably the best species to try is going to be the black walnut. Then again, there's, there's some good information available on making syrup from black walnut. It's a good quality product. Um, it doesn't have quite as high a sugar content as uh, sugar maple sap does, but again, makes a very nice product and uh, encourage you to, to consider black walnut. Now, other species that are of interest, uh, any of the other maples, such as silver maple, box elder, or, uh, or even Norway maple, which is uh, non-native invasive maple, would be good candidates to try. Once you move beyond the maples and the walnuts, it gets a little more problematic. I, I have heard of people collecting sap from sycamore. I've heard of people collecting sap from various types of birches. Uh, I've not really heard or read much about hickory, so I really can't give you much uh, 
much thought there, but uh, certainly the uh, black walnut is, is worthy of an attempt. Next question is also from Megan. She asks, she says, the majority of our big enough trees are walnut and I'm allergic to walnuts. Wondering if there's any info on cross reactivity between walnuts, the nut and walnut syrup sap. That is a good question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, I, I guess it, go ahead and, and make some syrup and then obviously take a very small sample and see if it does have an effect. Um, it, it all depends on, on what the active ingredient is that's causing your allergic reaction. And it may or may not be present in the sap if it's present in the nuts. All right, next question is from Jennifer. She asks, how do you keep track of where you've placed taps from year to year? Well, you know, um, oftentimes you can find the tap if you look very carefully, but as Henry mentioned, the, uh, the tree, if it's in good health, will very quickly heal over the tap and it may be a little bit of a challenge to find it, but uh, you can find it. And uh, especially if it's a tree you've tapped several times, you can kind of trace the progression of taps around the tree. Now, again, remember, as Henry mentioned, you want to move over and then either up or down in each year as you make your taps. what temperature it was when the video was made. Oh gosh, it varied all the way from really cold to really warm. You may have noticed on that second day when all that stuff was flying around us as we were moving the pen, you know, they looked like ashes, but it was actually snow. We had a flurry of snow come in as we were uh, moving that pan around. But yeah, it, it started out really cold on the second day, but then by the time we had finished uh, with the sap around lunchtime, it was nearly shirt sleeve weather. But again, that's, that's January in Missouri, isn't it? Anonymous asks, is it too warm already to tap this year? I believe it is too warm. Again, as Henry mentioned, the ideal conditions for tapping are when night temperatures drop below freezing and day temperatures are warm. You know, there still may be a chance, but by the time the trees start to break bud, the flow of sap greatly diminishes. Another anonymous question, does the steam smell like maple syrup as the sap cooks? Oh my goodness, it did. Boy, that was such a wonderful place to be. Even at the beginning of the boil, when you were working with, with dilute, dilute, you know, this, the sugar was fairly dilute, you could really smell the maple uh, scent. And my coat came away from that adventure smelling very much like maple syrup. And does the, does the smell get stronger as it dilutes, as it boils more? It does indeed, yes. Okay. It does indeed get stronger. Interesting. All right. Ron asks, why remove the pan from the furnace and put it back for day two boil? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? <clears throat> sure. Um, why do you remove the pan from the furnace and put it back for day two boil? Well, we removed it from the furnace because the, uh, the uh, uh, furnace wasn't all the way out when we kind of sh uh, shut things down on day one, and Henry didn't want anything to go wrong. So we moved the pan off onto a a set of sawhorses and then moved it back on the second day. All right, next question. What's the ratio of walnut sap to syrup ratio? So it's going to be a, a bit higher than, than the maple ratio. You know, with, with maple, uh, it's anywhere from 30 to, to 50 gallons of uh, uh, sap will result in about a gallon of, of syrup. But walnut having a lower uh, amount of sugar when you start you're typically going to be running something higher, probably closer to 60 or 65 gallons of sap to a gallon of syrup. Okay. All right, next question is from Caitlin. She asks, she says, maybe I missed it, but is there a reason he was using that little scoop to move the syrup instead of pouring it in with a funnel? Well, um, I think Henry liked his scoop, first of all. But, you know, secondly, especially when he was working from a larger pan and filtering the first time, and even when he was moving from his finished pan and, and uh, filtering, he wanted to, to uh, I mean, he was working with hot sap and the pan was hot as well. And so you know, didn't want to take any chances at all in, in having any sort of mishap, particularly as we were working with the, uh, the uh, finished pan. All right. Next question, Hannah asks, do you have to have a sugar, sugar sack, sugar shack, set up <laughs> to turn sap into syrup. Oh my goodness, okay. Um, or could you do this in a kitchen setting on a smaller scale? Well, I, I will mention my very first adventure with, with syrup making. Um, I had collected about 40 gallons of, of sap and I was bound and determined to make maple syrup and, and I did not have a sugar shack. All I had was the kitchen range. And so um, my, my uh, wife happened to be gone that day and I started boiling down 
and all I had was, was uh, uh, you know, turkey fryer. I started boiling down and boiling down and keeping at, adding more sap and boiling down. And, and yes, I produced some wonderful maple syrup, but also the walls of the kitchen were dripping with condensation. And it had that white maple fragrance. And when my wife returned that evening, she had some questions about what I had been doing all day. So it, it does make sense to do at least the, the initial boil. Uh, in an area where you have good ventilation, where you can draw off all of the uh, condensation that is released as you're boiling. Yes, you could do it in, in the kitchen, but you definitely want to have the windows open and an exhaust fan. On. But it's probably more practical to do it uh, outdoors, perhaps in the garage or even in the open, where all of that humidity can very quickly dissipate. Would it be an option to just start with less sap as well? Would that help at all? Uh, it certainly would, but again, remember the, the amount of syrup that, that you end up with depends upon how much raw material you put into it. And, you know, a turkey fryer doesn't hold all that much. And if your goal is to make a gallon or, or you know, whatever it might be, you have to keep adding sap in as you do the initial boil, you know, until you get to the point where you're getting down to the volume, finished volume of syrup that you're interested in. Okay. All right. Next question. Um, oh, this is a statement. James says, uh, our Facebook group is Missouri Maple Syrup, so that could be a good resource for people watching tonight. Oh, excellent. Yeah, check it out. Yeah. I'll put that in the chat in a minute as well. Um, James also said, hickory is normally made from boiling the bark. Yeah, the, when, I've, when I've had hickory syrup, you're, you're correct. It's made by boiling the bark essentially as a flavoring that is then added to some other type of syrup. Has another question. Is there a limit on how many times you can tap a single tree in one season um, or how long in between toppings should you wait? Well, typically you're just tapping a tree once in the season and that tap will continue to produce sap as long as the uh, sap flow is underway. You know, weather conditions are right, but you don't have to make multiple taps in, in one season. Now, again, as Henry mentioned, particularly as you get towards the end of the sap flow, it may be necessary to go and clean out that tap hole. And you know, you're again the same tap hole, but you can go in and, and run your drill up and down in it one more time, put the tap back in, use that same tap hole for, for the rest of the season. All right. Jessica has a question. Uh, she says, I have three sugar maples that I planted a few years ago on our property. When can I tap them for sap? Well, again, remember the advice of at least 10 inches in diameter before you 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 tap them for the first time. And, and that's even a little bit on the small side in, in Henry's opinion. It probably would be better to have a tree that were, you know, that was closer to, to uh, 12 inches in diameter. But, you know, even, even a 10 inch diameter tree could be tapped. All right. Tiffany asks, as long as the tree is healthy, the age of the tree doesn't matter. Is that correct? That's correct. It's more a function of the, uh, the size of the tree. And again, as Henry mentioned, the most productive trees have large canopies. So, you know, look, look at the, uh, the girth, the diameter of the tree, and then look up and get a feel for the uh, size of the canopy. And that'll give you a clue if that's going to be a good tree to tap. Right. Kathy asks, what is the minimum number of trees needed? Well, that's a good question. It, again, it all depends, first of all, on how much sap you would like to make. Um, you know, the, the quantity of sap or how much syrup you would like to make, the quantity of sap that a tree produces is, is, is very, it's, it's really variable. It depends upon the particular season. It depends upon the, uh, the, the weather during the particular season. And, you know, one tree could produce 10, 15 gallons of sap over the course of the, uh, the uh, sugaring season. Or if it's not a good year, it may produce much less. So again, that just, it's, it's hard to give you a, a strict uh, recommendation on that because there are so many variables at play. All right, Megan asks, what does walnut syrup smell or taste like? It is absolutely delicious. Um, it, it actually, at least to my taste, is much like maple syrup, but there's a bit of a nuttiness to it that maple syrup doesn't have that I find very good. All right. Robin asks, what can you use the sap for if you don't have the time or ability to boil it into syrup? Ooh, well, keep in mind that that sap is not very stable. It's, it's very prone to spoiling if it isn't uh, uh, made into syrup fairly quickly. Again, as Henry mentioned, if you can't boil it down immediately, you've got to keep it cool. And uh, again, the, the sap as it comes out of the tree has molds and yeasts and various other organisms in it. 
And unless it's boiled, those organisms will very quickly cause it to, to spoil and develop a sour uh, taste and, and an unpleasant aroma. So, you know, what can you do with it if you're not going to boil it down? It's probably best to leave it in the tree. Um, how long, I know you want to, you want to boil it fairly quickly, but if you need to take a day or two, kind of what's the window for that? Well, it depends on how cool you can keep it. You know, if you can keep it in a refrigerator or, or even, even a colder area, it will keep for some time. But again, uh, if, if the weather's warm and it's sitting out and you're not refrigerating it, it needs to be boiled pretty quickly. That makes sense. All right. Next question asks, how much sap can you expect to get from one tree in a season? Yeah, and again, they have that's, black walnuts. And again, that's a good question. Black walnuts typically are less productive than sugar maples. Um, and again, there, there just isn't enough uh, information out there to give you a firm number. Uh, and, and add to that, of course, the variability of each season. You might have a good year, you might have a not so good year if the weather doesn't cooperate. Elizabeth asks, what setup would you suggest of boiling outside without a sugar shack? What would you use for the pan, the heat source, et cetera? You could actually use a setup that you would use for frying a turkey, you know, using a propane burner under a turkey boiler or a turkey fryer. That works quite well. You want to keep the heat fairly low. And again, you, especially towards the end of the boil, you've got to watch it very carefully because I, I've seen... Uh, videos and pictures of what happens if you allow the sap to boil over. It just rises up and goes over the edge and it's a disaster. So be very cautious about the height of the flame on your propane burner. Linda asks, how is the milk jug attached to the tree? So the milk jug has a, a small hole that is uh, cut into it. And it, you may have noticed as Henry was putting that tap into the tree, there was a little hook on that particular style of tap. And you just push the uh, hole in the milk jug over the tap, and then you hook the top of it with the hook on the, uh, on the uh, tap, and it holds it in place very nicely. All right, very good. Uh, I'm also looking through the chat, and this is in response to it, an earlier question, but Dwight says that they have 20 gallons of black walnut sap at two bricks, and they plan to take, take it to 22, bricks and make wine. So wine is another option for oh, the there you go. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Um, all right, next question. Elaine says, does Henry sell his syrup commercially and are there other sources for locally sapped syrups? Uh, Henry does not sell his sap. And, and again, you can kind of tell from his setup that he's focused on, you know, the, the pleasure of making the, the, the syrup. And, and again, if he were uh, interested in, in going the route of commercial sales, he would have to upgrade his equipment but he's perfectly happy where he is. Now, as far as local sources, yes, there are. And, and a quick internet search will bring up a number of, of local syrup makers that, uh, that have sap available for sale. And, and again, I've, I've tried a number of these and I've been you know, just so pleased with the quality of the syrup that our local syrup makers are producing. Very good. Um, Tiffany asks, um, have you ever heard of anyone topping a chestnut or a pecan tree? Uh, I have not heard of anyone tapping chestnut or pecan. It doesn't mean it can't be done. I just haven't heard of anyone doing that. Okay. All right. That's all the questions we have right now. Very good. This has been a, a, a really fun evening for me. And, and you could probably tell from the video that I immensely enjoyed myself working with Henry and shooting that video. Um, again, if you have any questions moving ahead relative to... Uh, uh, making maple syrup or making syrup from other, other tree saps, so reach out to the Agroforestry Center. and They have some excellent resources. And uh, if I can be of assistance, feel free to reach out to me as well. So uh, Anna, thanks so much for joining us tonight and for uh, keeping things moving along. And I want to thank everyone who uh, joined the, uh, the uh, workshop this evening.